Act One of The Blunderer or The Counterplots by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the third volume of the Select Comedies of Monsieur de Moliere, London, 1732, the blunderer is dedicated to the Right Honorable Philip, Earl of Chesterfield, in the following words. My Lord, the translation of Le Tourdi, which, in company with the original, throws itself at your lordship's feet, is a part of a design formed by some gentlemen of exhibiting to the public a select collection of Moliere's plays, in French and English. This author, my lord, was truly a genius, caressed by the greatest men of his own time, and honored with the patronage of princes. When the translator, therefore, of this piece was to introduce him in an English dress, in justice he owed him an English patron, and was readily determined to your lordship, whom all the world allows to be a genius of the first rank. But he is too sensible of the beauties of his author, and the refined taste your lordship is universally known to have in polite literature, to plead anything but your candor and goodness for your acceptance of this performance. He persuades himself that your lordship, who best knows how difficult it is to speak like Moliere, even when we have his sentiments to inspire us, will be readiest to forgive the imperfections of this attempt. He is the rather encouraged, my lord, to hope for a candid reception from your lordship, on account of the usefulness of this design, which he flatters himself will have your approbation. Tis to spirit greater numbers of our countrymen to read this author, who would otherwise not have attempted it, or, being foiled in their attempts, would throw him by in despair. And however generally the French language may be read, or spoke, in England, there will be still very great numbers, even of those who are said to understand French, who, to master this comic writer, will want the help of a translation. And glad would the publishers of this work be to guide the feebler steps of some such persons, not only till they should want no translation, but till some of them should be able to make a much better than the present. The great advantage of understanding Moliere, your lordship best knows. What is it but almost to understand mankind? He has shown such a compass of knowledge in human nature as scarce to leave it in the power of succeeding writers in comedy to be originals. Whence it has, in fact, appeared that they who, since his time, have most excelled in the comic way, have copied Moliere, and therein were sure of copying nature. In this author, my lord, our youth will find the strongest sense, the purest moral, and the keenest satire, accompanied with the utmost politeness, so that our countrymen may take a French polish, without danger of commencing fops and apes, as they sometimes do by an affectation of the dress and manners of that people. For no man has better portrayed, or in a finer manner exposed fopperies of all kinds, than this our author has, in one or other of his pieces. And now, tis not doubted, my lord, but your lordship is under some apprehensions, and the reader under some expectation, that the translator should attempt your character, in right of a dedicator, as a refined wit and consummate statesman. But, my lord, Speaking the truth to a person of your lordship's accomplishments would have the appearance of flattery, especially to those who have not the honor of knowing you, and those who have conceive greater ideas of you than the translator will pretend to express. Permit him then, my lord, to crave your lordship's acceptance of this piece, which appears to you with a fair and correct copy of the original, but with a translation which can be of no manner of consequence to your lordship, only as it may be of consequence to those who would understand Moliere if they could. Your lordship's countenance to recommend it to such will infinitely oblige, my lord, your lordship's most devoted and most obedient, humble servant, the translator. Dramatis Personae Lelia, Son de Pandolfos, read by Lian Yao. Leander, a young gentleman of good birth, read by Thomas Peter. Anselmo, an old man, read by Sonia. Pandolphus, an old man, read by Nemo. Trufalden, an old man, read by Todd. Andreas, a supposed gypsy, read by Son of the Exiles. Masqueril, servant to Lelio, read by Larry Wilson. Ergast, a servant, read by Alan Mapstone. A Messenger, read by Zames Curran. Celia, slave to Trufalden, 
read by t j burns hippolyta daughter to anselmo read by eva davis stage directions read by devora allen scene messina the blunderer or the counterplots act one scene one lelio alone very well leander very well we must quarrel then we shall see which of us two will gain the day and which in our mutual pursuit after this young miracle of beauty will thwart the most his rival's addresses do whatever you can defend yourself well for depend upon it on my side no pain shall be spared scene two lelio masqueril ah masqueril what's the matter a great deal is the matter everything crosses my love leander is enamoured of celia the fates have willed it that though i have changed the object of my passion he still remains my rival leander enamoured of celia he adores her i tell you so much the worse yes so much the worse and that's what annoys me however i should be wrong to despair for since you aid me i ought to take courage i know that your mind can plan many intrigues and never finds anything too difficult that you should be called the prince of servants and that throughout the whole world a truce to these compliments when people have need of us poor servants we are darlings and incomparable creatures but at other times at the least fit of anger we are scoundrels and ought to be soundly thrashed nay upon my word you wrong me by this remark but let us talk a little about the captive tell me is there a heart so cruel so unfeeling as to be proof against such charming features for my part in her conversation as well as in her countenance i see evidence of her noble birth i believe that heaven has concealed a lofty origin beneath such a lowly station you are very romantic with all your fancies but what will pandolphus do in this case he is your father at least he says so you know very well that his bile is pretty often stirred up that he can rage against you finally when your behaviour offends him he is now in treaty with anselmo about your marriage with his daughter hippolyta imagining that it is marriage alone that mayhap can steady you now should he discover that you reject his choice and that you entertain a passion for a person nobody knows anything about that the fatal power of this foolish love causes you to forget your duty and disobey him ah heaven knows what a storm will then burst forth and what fine lectures you will be treated to a truce i pray to your rhetoric rather a truce to your manner of loving it is none of the best and you ought to endeavour don't you know that nothing is gained by making me angry that remonstrances are badly rewarded by me and that a servant who counsels me acts against his own interest ah he is in a passion now all that i said was but in jest and to try you do i look so very much like a censor and is mascarel an enemy to pleasure you know the contrary and that it is only too certain people can tax me without nothing but being too good-natured laugh at the preachings of an old grey beard of a father go on i tell you and mind them not upon my word i am of opinion that these old effete and grumpy libertines come to stupefy us with their silly stories and being virtuous out of necessity hope through sheer envy to deprive young people of all the pleasures of life you know my talents i am at your service now this is talking in a manner i like moreover when i first declared my passion it was not ill received by the lovely object who inspired it but just now leander has declared to me that he is preparing to deprive me of celia therefore let us make haste ransack your brain for the speediest means to secure me possession of her plan any tricks stratagems rogueries inventions to frustrate my rival's pretensions let me think upon this matter mm, what can i invent upon this urgent occasion well the stratagem what a hurry you are in my brain must always move slowly 
i have found what you want you must uh, uh no 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 that's not it but if you could go whither no that's a flimsy trick i thought that uh, what is it that will not do either but could you not can i not what no you could not do anything speak to anselmo and what can i say to him that is true that would be falling out of the frying pan into the fire something must be done however go to trufalden what to do i don't know oh sounds this is too much you drive me mad with this idle talk sir if you could lay your hand on plenty of pistoles we should have no need now to think of and try to find out what means we must employ in compassing our wishes we might by purchasing this slave quickly prevent your rival from forestalling and thwarting you trufalden who takes charge of her is rather uneasy about these gypsies who placed her with him if he could get back his money which they have made him wait for too long i am quite sure he would be delighted to sell her for he always lived like the veriest curmudgeon he would allow himself to be whipped for the smallest coin in the realm money is the god he worships above everything but the worst of it is that what is the worst of it that your father is just as covetous an old hunk who does not allow you to handle his ducats as you would like but there is no way by which we could now open ever so small a purse in order to help you but let us endeavour to speak to celia for a moment to know what she thinks about this affair this is her window but trufalden watches her closely night and day take her let us keep quiet in this corner ah ah what luck here she is coming just in the nick of time scene three celia lelio masqueril ah madam what obligations do i owe to heaven for allowing me to behold those celestial charms you are blessed with whatever sufferings your eyes may have caused me i cannot but take delight in gazing on them in this place my heart which has good reason to be astonished at your speech does not wish my eyes to injure any one if they have offended you in anything i can assure you i did not intend it oh no their glances are too pleasing to do me an injury i count it my chief glory to cherish the wounds they give me and you are soaring rather too high this style is by no means what we want now let us make better use of our time let us know of her quickly what trefalden within celia masqueril to lelio well what do you think now oh cruel mischance what business has this wretched old man to interrupt us go withdraw i'll find something to say to him scene four trefalden celia masqueril and lelio in a corner trefalden to celia what are you doing out of doors and what induces you to go out you whom i have forbidden to speak to any one i was formerly acquainted with this respectable young man you have no occasion to be suspicious of him is this signor trufalden yes it is himself sir i am wholly yours it gives me extreme pleasure to have this opportunity of paying my most humble respects to a gentleman who is everywhere so highly spoken of your most humble servant perhaps i am troublesome but i have been acquainted with this young woman elsewhere and as i heard about the great skill she has in predicting the future i wished to consult her about a certain affair what do you dabble in the black art no sir my skill lies entirely in the white the case is this the master whom i serve languishes for a fair lady who has captivated him he would gladly disclose the passion which burns within him to the beauteous object whom he adores but a dragon that guards this rare treasure in spite of all his attempts has hitherto prevented him and what torments him still more and makes him miserable 
is that he has just discovered a formidable rival so that i have come to consult you to know whether his love is likely to meet with any success be well assured that from your mouth i may learn truly the secret which concerns us under what planet was your master born under the planet which never alters his love without asking you to name the object he sighs for the science which i possess gives me sufficient information this young woman is high-spirited and knows how to preserve a noble pride in the midst of adversity she is not inclined to declare too freely the secret sentiments of her heart but i know them as well as herself and am going with a more composed mind to unfold them all to you in a few words oh wonderful power of magic virtue if your master is really constant in his affections and if virtue alone prompts him let him be under no apprehension of sighing in vain he has reason to hope the fortress he wishes to take is not averse to capitulation but rather inclined to surrender that's something but then the fortress depends upon a governor whom it is hard to gain over there lies the difficulty Mascarille, aside looking at lelio the deuce takes this troublesome fellow who is always watching us i am going to teach you what you ought to do lelio joining them mr trevaldon give yourself no farther uneasiness it was purely in obedience to my orders that this trusty servant came to visit you i dispatched him to offer you my services and to speak to you concerning this young lady whose liberty i am willing to purchase before long provided we two can agree about the terms Mascarille aside plague take the ass ho oh, ho which of the two am i to believe this story contradicts the former very much sir this gentleman is a little bit wrong in the upper story and <laughs> did you not know it i know what i know and begin to smell a rat to celia get you in and never take such a liberty again as for you two arrogant rogues or i am much mistaken if you wish to deceive me again let your stories be a little more in harmony scene five lelio masqueril he is quite right to speak plainly i wish he had given us both a sound cudgelling what was the good of showing yourself and like a blunderer coming and giving the lie to all that i had been saying i thought i did right to be sure ah, but this action ought not to surprise me you possess so many counterplots that your freaks no longer astonish anybody good heavens how i am scolded for nothing is the harm so great that it cannot be remedied however if you cannot place celia in my hands you may at least contrive to frustrate all leander's schemes so that he cannot purchase this fair one before me but lest my presence should be further mischievous i leave you masqueril alone very well to say the truth money would be a sure and staunch agent in our cause but as this mainspring is lacking we must uh, employ some other means scene six anselmo masqueril upon my word this is a strange age we live in i am ashamed of it there was never such a fondness for money and never so much difficulty in getting one's own notwithstanding all the care a person may take deaths nowadays are like children begot with pleasure but brought forth with pain it is pleasant for money to come into our purse but when the time comes that we have to give it back then the pangs of labour seize us enough of this it is no trifle to receive at last two thousand francs which have been owing upwards of two years what luck masqueril aside good heavens what fine game to shoot flies hist let me see if i cannot wheedle him a little i know what speeches to soothe him joining him anselmo 
i have just seen who pretty your narina <laughs> what does the cruel fair one say about me say that she is passionately fond of you is she she loves you so that i very much pity her oh how happy you make me the poor thing is nearly dying with love oh my dearest anselmo she cries every minute when shall marriage unite our two hearts when will you vouchsafe to extinguish my flames but why has she hitherto concealed this from me <sighs> girls in troth are great dissemblers Masquery, what do you say really though in years yet i look still well enough to please the eye yes truly that face of yours is still very passable if it is not of the handsomest in the world it is very agreeable so that masqueril endeavouring to take the purse so that she dotes on you and regards you no longer what but as a husband and fully intends and fully intends and fully intends uh, whatever may happen to steal your purse <laughs> to steal masqueril taking the purse and letting it fall to the ground to steal a kiss from your mouth ah oh, i understand you come hither the next time you see her be sure to say as many fine things of me as possible let me alone farewell may heaven guide you anselmo returning hold i really should have committed a strange piece of folly and you might justly have accused me of neglect i engage you to assist me in serving my passion you bring good tidings and i do not give you the smallest present to reward your zeal here be sure to remember oh pray don't permit me i won't indeed i do not act thus for the sake of money i know you do not but however no anselmo i will not i am a man of honour this offends me farewell then muskery ah how long-winded he is anselmo coming back i wish you to carry a present to the fair object of my desires i will give you some money to buy her a ring or any other trifle as you may think will please her most now there is no need of your money without troubling yourself i will make her a present a fashionable ring has been left in my hands which you may pay for afterwards if it fits her be it so give it her in my name but above all manage matters in such a manner that she may still desire to make me her own scene seven lelio anselmo masqueril lelio taking up the purse whose purse is this during the whole of the preceding scene masqueril has quietly kicked the purse away so as to be out of sight of anselmo intending to pick it up when the latter has gone oh heavens i dropped it and might have afterwards believed somebody had picked my pocket i am very much obliged to you for your kindness which saves me a great deal of vexation and restores me my money i shall go home this minute and get rid of it scene eight lelio masqueril old death you have been very obliging very much so upon my word if it had not been for me he would have lost his money certainly you do wonders and show to-day a most exquisite judgment and supreme good fortune we shall prosper greatly go on as you have begun what is the matter now what have i done to speak plainly as you wish me to do and as i ought you have acted like a fool 
you know very well that your father leaves you without money that a formidable rival follows us closely yet for all this when to oblige you i venture on a trick of which i take all the shame and danger upon myself what was this yes ninny it was to release the captive that i was getting the money whereof your officiousness took care to deprive us if that is the case i am in the wrong but who could have imagined it it really required a great deal of discernment you should have made some signs to warn me of what was going on yes indeed i ought to have eyes in my back by jove be quiet and let us hear no more of your nonsensical excuses another after all this would perhaps abandon everything but i have planned just now a master-stroke which i will immediately put into execution on condition that if no i promise you henceforth not to interfere either in word or deed go away then the very sight of you kindles my wrath above all don't delay for fear that in this business once more i tell you be gone i will set about it exit lelio let us manage this well it will be the most exquisite piece of roguery if it succeeds as i think it must we'll try uh, oh but here comes the very man i want scene nine pandolphus mascareel mascaria sir to tell you the truth i'm very dissatisfied with my son with my master you are not the only one who complains of him his bad conduct which has grown unbearable in everything puts me each moment out of patience i thought however you and he understood one another pretty well i believe it not sir i am always trying to put him in mind of his duty we are perpetually at daggers drawn just now we had a quarrel again about his engagement with hippolyta which i find he is very averse to by a most disgraceful refusal he violates all the respect due to a father a quarrel yes a quarrel and a desperate one too i was very much deceived then for i thought you supported him in all he did i see what this world has come to how is innocent always oppressed if you knew but my integrity you would give me the additional salary of a tutor whereas i am only paid as his servant yes you yourself could not say more to him than i do in order to make him behave better for goodness sake sir i say to him very often cease to be driven hither and thither by every wind that blows reform look what a worthy father heaven has given you what a reputation he has forbear to stab him thus to the heart and live as he does as a man of honour that was well said and what answer could he make to this answer why only nonsense with which he almost drives me mad not but that at the bottom of his heart he retains those principles of honour which he derives from you but reason at present does not sway him if i might be allowed to speak freely you should soon see him submissive without much trouble speak out it is a secret which would have serious consequences for me should it be discovered but i am quite sure i can confide it to your prudence you are right know then that your wishes are sacrificed to the love your son has for a certain slave i have been told so before but to hear it from your mouth pleases me i leave you to judge whether i am his secret confidant i am truly glad of it however do you wish to bring him back to his duty without any public scandal you must i am in perpetual fear lest anybody should surprise us should he learn what i have told you i should be a dead man you must as i was saying to break off this business secretly purchase this slave whom he so much idolizes and send her into another country anselmo is very intimate with trufaldin let him go and buy her for you this very morning then if you put her into my hands i know some merchants and promise to sell her for the money she costs you and to send her out of the way in spite of your son 
for if you would have him disposed for matrimony we must avert this growing passion moreover even if he were resolved to wear the yoke you designed for him yet this other girl might revive his foolish fancy and prejudice him anew against matrimony very well argued but i like this advice much here comes anselmo go i will do my utmost quickly to obtain possession of this troublesome slave when i will put her into your hands to finish the rest mascarille alone bravo i will go and tell my master of this long live all knavery and knaves also scene ten hippolyta mascarille ay traitor is it thus that you serve me i overheard all and have myself been a witness of your treachery had i not could i have suspected this you are an errant rogue and you have deceived me you promised me you miscreant and i expected that you would assist me in my passion for leander that your skill and management should find means to break off my match with lelio that you would free me from my father's project and yet you are doing quite the contrary but you will find yourself mistaken i know a sure method of breaking off the purchase you have been urging pandolphus to make and i will go immediately how impetuous you are you fly into a passion in a moment without inquiring whether you are right or wrong and you fall foul of me i am in the wrong and i ought to make your words true without finishing what i began since you abused me so outrageously by what illusion do you think to dazzle my eyes traitor can you deny what i have just now heard no but you must know that all this plotting was only contrived to serve you that this cunning advice which appeared so sincere tends to make both old men fall into the snare that all the pains i have taken for getting celia into my hands through their means was to secure her for lelio and to arrange matters so that anselmo in the very height of passion and finding himself disappointed of his son-in-law might make choice of leander what this admirable scheme which has angered me so much was all for my sake masquerie yes for your sake but since i find my good offices met with so bad a return since i have thus to bear your caprices and as a reward for my services you come here with a haughty air and call me knave cur and cheat i shall presently go correct the mistake i had committed and undo what i had undertaken to perform hippolyta holding him nay do not be so severe upon me and forgive these outbursts of a sudden passion no no let me go i have it yet in my power to set aside the scheme which offends you so much henceforth you shall have no occasion to complain of my zeal yes you shall have my master i promise you my good masquerie be not in such a passion i judged you ill i was wrong i confess i was pulls out her purse but i intend to atone for my fault with this could you find it in your heart to abandon me thus no i cannot do what i will but your impetuosity was very shocking let me tell you that nothing offends a noble mind so much as the smallest imputation upon its honour it is true i treated you to some very harsh language but here are two louis to heal your wounds oh all this is nothing i am very sensitive on this point but my passion begins to cool a little already we must bear with the failings of our friends can you then bring about what i so earnestly wish for do you believe your daring projects will be as favourable to my passion as you imagine do not make yourself uneasy on that account i have several irons in the fire and though this stratagem should fail us what this cannot do another shall depend upon it hippolyta will at least not be ungrateful it is not the hope of gain that makes me act your master beckons and wishes to speak with you i will leave you but remember to do what you can for me scene eleven lelio masquerile what the deuce are you doing here you promised to perform wonders but i am sure your dilatory ways are unparalleled 
had not my good genius inspired me, my happiness had been already wholly overthrown. There was an end to my good fortune, my joy. I should have been a prey to eternal grief. In short, had I not gone to this place in the very nick of time, Anselmo would have got possession of the captive, and I should have been deprived of her. He was carrying her home, but I parried the thrust, warded off the blow, and so worked upon Trafalden's fears as to make him keep the girl. This is the third time. When we come to ten, we will score. It was my contrivance, incorrigible scatterbrains, that Anselmo undertook this desirable purchase. She should have been placed into my own hands, but your cursed officiousness knocks everything on the head again. Do you think I shall still labor to serve your love? I would sooner a hundred times become a fat old woman, a dolt, a cabbage, a lantern, a werewolf, and that Satan should twist your neck. Lelio, alone. I must take him to some tavern, and let him vent his passion on the bottles and glasses. End of Act One Act Two of The Blunderer, or The Counterplots, by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, Lelio Mascarille. I have at length yielded to your desires. In spite of all my protestations, I could hold out no longer. I am going to venture upon new dangers to promote your interest, which I intended to abandon. So tender-hearted am I. If Dame Nature had made a girl of Masqueril, I leave you to guess what would have happened. However, after this assurance, do not deal a backstroke to the project I am about to undertake. Do not make a blunder and frustrate my expectations. Then as to Anselmo, we shall anew present your excuses to him in order to get what we desire. But should your imprudence burst forth again hereafter, then you may bid farewell to all the trouble I take for the object of your passion. No, I shall be careful, I tell you. Never fear, you shall see. Well, mind that you keep your word. I have planned a bold stratagem for your sake. Your father is very backward in satisfying all your wishes by his death. I have just killed him, uh, in words I mean. I have spread a report that the good man, being suddenly smitten by a fit of apoplexy, has departed this life. But first, so that I might the better pretend he was dead, I so managed that he went to his barn. I had a person ready to come and tell him that the workman employed in his house accidentally discovered a treasure in digging the foundations he set out in an instant and as all his people except us two have gone with him into the country i shall kill him to-day in everybody's imagination and produce some image which i shall bury under his name i have already told you what i wish you to do play out your part well and as to the character i have to keep up if you perceive that I miss one word of it, tell me plainly I am nothing but a fool. Scene 2. Lelio, alone. It is true. He has found out a strange way to accomplish my wishes fully. But when we are very much in love with a fair lady, what would we not do to be made happy? If love is said to be an excuse for a crime, it may well serve for a slight piece of imposture, which love's ardour today compels me to comply with in expectation of the happy consequences that may result from it. Oh, bless me. How expeditious they are. I see them already talking together about it. Let us prepare to act our part. Scene 3. Mascarille and Selmo. The news may well surprise you. To die in such a manner. He was certainly much to blame. I can never forgive him for such a freak not even to take time to be ill no never was a man in such a hurry to die how does lelio behave he raves and has lost all command over his temper he has beaten himself till he is black and blue in several places 
and wishes to follow his father into the grave in short to make an end of this the excess of his grease has made me with the utmost speed wrap the corpse in a shroud for fear the sight which fed his melancholy should tempt him to commit some rash act no matter you ought to have waited until evening besides i should have liked to see pandolphus once more he who puts a shroud on a man too hastily very often commits murder for a man is frequently thought dead when he only seems to be so i warrant him as dead as dead can be but now to return to what we were talking about lelo has resolved and it will do him good to give his father a fine funeral and to comfort the deceased a little for his hard fate by pleasure of seeing that we pay him such honours after his death my master inherits a goodly estate but as he is only a novice in business and does not see his way clearly in his affairs since the greater part of his property lies in another part of the country or what he has here consists in paper he would beg of you after having entreated you to excuse the too great violence which he has shown of late to lend him for this last duty at least you have told me so already and i will go and see him Masqueril alone hitherto at least everything goes on swimmingly let us endeavour to make the rest answer as well and lest we should be wrecked in the very harbour let us steer the ship carefully and keep a sharp lookout scene four anselmo lelio Masqueril. anselmo coming out of pandolphus's house let us leave the house i cannot without great sorrow see him wrapped up in this strange manner alas in so short a time he was alive this morning we go sometimes over a good deal of ground in a short time lelio weeping <gasps> oh dear lelio he was but a man after all even rome can grant no dispensation from death oh death smites man without giving warning and always has bad designs against them <sighs> that merciless foe would not loosen one grip of his murderous teeth however we may entreat him everybody must feel them <laughs> your preaching will all be in vain this sorrow is too deep-rooted to be plucked up if notwithstanding all these arguments you will not cast aside your grief at least my dear lelio endeavour to moderate it <laughs> he will not moderate it i know his temper however according to your servant's message i have brought you the money you want so that you might celebrate your father's funeral obsequies <laughs> how his grief increases at these words it will kill him to think of his misfortune i know you will find by the good man's books that i owe him a much larger sum but even if i should not owe anything you could freely command my purse here it is i am entirely at your service and will show it lelio going away oh how full of grief is my master Mascari, i think it right he should give me some kind of receipt under his hand oh nothing in this world is certain oh oh get him to sign me the receipt i require alas how can he comply with your desire in the condition he now is give him but time to get rid of his sorrow and when his troubles abate a little i shall take care immediately to get you your security your servant sir my heart is overfull of grief and i shall go to take my full of weeping with him hi hi anselmo alone 
oh the world is full of crosses we meet with them every day in different shapes and never here below scene five pandolphus and selmo oh, oh heavens how i tremble it is pandolphus who has returned to the earth god grant nothing disturbed his repose how wan his face is grown since his death oh, do not come any nearer i beseech you i very much detest to jostle a ghost what can be the reason of this whimsical terror keep your distance and tell me what business brings you here if you have taken all this trouble to bid me farewell you do me too much honour i could really have done very well without your compliment if your soul is restless and stands in need of prayers i promise you you shall have them but do not frighten me upon the word of a terrified man i will immediately set prayers a-going for you to your very heart's content oh that worship please to go heaven if now you disappear will grant you joy down there below and health as well for many a year <laughs> in spite of my indignation i cannot help laughing it is strange but you are very merry for a dead man is this a joke pray tell me or is it downright madness to treat a living man as if he were dead alas you must be dead i myself just now saw you what could i die without knowing it as soon as masquerie told me the news i was ready to die of grief but really are you asleep or awake don't you know me you are clothed in an aerial body which imitates your own but which may take another shape at any moment i am mightily afraid to see you swell up to the size of a giant and your countenance become frightfully distorted for the love of god do not assume any hideous form you have scared me sufficiently for the nuns at any other time anselmo i should have considered the simplicity which accompanies your credulity an excellent joke and i should have carried on the pleasant conceit a little longer but this story of my death and the news of the supposed treasure which i was told upon the road had not been found at all raises in my mind a strong suspicion that masqueria is a rogue and an arrogant rogue who is proof against fear or remorse and who invents extraordinary stratagems to compass his ends what am i tricked and made a fool of really this would be a compliment to my good sense let me touch him and be satisfied this is indeed the very man oh what an ass i am pray do not spread this story about for they will write a farce about it and shame me for ever but pandolphus help me to get the money back which i lent them to bury you <laughs> money do you say ha huh. oh that is where the shoe pinches that is the secret of the whole affair so much the worse for you for my part i shall not trouble myself about it but will go and lay an information against this masqueria and if he can be caught he shall be hanged whatever the cost may be anselmo alone <sighs> and i like a ninny believe a scoundrel and must in one day lose both my senses and my money upon my word it well becomes me to have these grey hairs and to commit an act of folly so readily without examining into the truth of the first story i hear but i see 
Scene six, Lelio, Anselmo. Now, with this master key, I can easily pay Trafalgar a visit. As far as I can see, your grief has subsided. What do you say? No, it can never leave a heart which shall ever cherish it dearly. I came back to tell you frankly of a mistake I made in the money I gave you just now. Amongst these Louis d'Or, though they look very good, I carelessly put some which I think are bad. I have brought some money with me to change them. The intolerable audacity of our coiners is grown to such a height in this state that no one can receive any money now without danger of his being imposed upon. It would be doing good service to hang them all. I am very much obliged to you for being willing to take them back, but I saw none among them that were bad, as I thought. Let me see the money. Let me see it. I shall know them again. Is this all? Yes. <laughs> so much the better. Are you back again, my dear money? get into my pocket as for you my gallant chopper you have no longer got a penny of it you kill people who are in good health do you and what would you have done then with me a poor infirm father-in-law upon my word i was going to get a nice addition to my family a most discreet son-in-law go go and hang yourself for shame and vexation lelio alone i really must admit i have been bit this time what a surprise this is how can you have discovered our stratagem so soon scene seven lelio masqueril what do you were out i have been hunting for you everywhere well we have succeeded at last I will give the greatest rogue six trials to do the like. Come, give me the money that I may go and buy the slave. Your rival will be very much astonished at this. Ah, oh, my dear boy, our luck has changed. Can you imagine how ill fortune has served me? What? What can it be? Anselmo, having found out the trick, just now got back every soul he lent us, pretending some of the gold pieces were bad, and that he was going to change them. You do but joke, I suppose. It is but too true. In good earnest? In good earnest. I am very much grieved about it. It would put you into a furious passion. Me, sir, a fool might, but not I. Anger hurts, and I am going to take care of myself, come what will. After all, whether Celia be captive or free, whether Leander purchase her, or whether she remains where she is, I do not care one stiver about it. Ah, oh, do not show such indifference, but be a little more indulgent to my slight imprudence. Had this last misfortune not happened, you would have confessed that I did wonders, and that in this pretended decease I deceived everybody, and counterfeited grief so admirably that the most sharp-sighted would have been taken in. Truly you have great reason to boast. Oh, I am to blame, and I am willing to acknowledge it. But if ever you care for my happiness, repair this mishap and help me. I kiss your hands. I cannot spare the time. Masquerel, my dear boy. No. Do me this favour. No, I will not. If you are inflexible, I shall kill myself. Do so. You may. Can I not soften your hard heart? No. Do you see my sword ready drawn? Yes. I am going to stab myself. Do just what you please. Would you not regret to be the cause of my death? No. Farewell, Masquerel. Goodbye, Master Lelio. What? Kill yourself quick. You are a long while about it. Upon my word! You would like me to play the fool and kill myself, so that you might get hold of my clothes. I knew this was nothing but a sham. Whatever people may swear they will do, they are not so hasty nowadays in killing themselves. Scene 8. Trafalden, Leander, Lelio, Mascarille. Trafalden taking Leander aside and whispering to him. 
What do I see? My rival and Trafalgar together. He is going to buy Celia. Oh, I tremble for fear. There is no doubt that he will do all he can, and if he has money, he can do all he will. For my part, I am delighted. This is a just reward for your blunders, your impatience. What must I do? Advise me. I don't know. Stay. I will go and pick a quarrel with him. What good will that do? What would you have me do to ward off this blow? Well, I pardon you. I will yet cast an eye of pity on you. Leave me to watch them. I believe I shall discover what he intends to do by fairer means. Exit Lelio. Trafalden to Leander. When you send, by and by, it shall be done. I must trap him and become his confidant in order to baffle his designs the more easily. Leander, alone. Thanks to heaven, my happiness is complete. I have found the way to secure it and fear nothing more. Whatever my rival may henceforth attempt, it is no longer in his power to do me any harm. Scene 9. Leander, Masqueril. Oh, oh, help, murder, help, they're killing me. Oh, 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 traitor, barbarian. Whence comes that noise? What is the matter? What are they doing to you? He has just given me two hundred blows with a cudgel. Who? Lelio. And for what reason? For a mere trifle he has turned me away and beats me most unmercifully. He is really much to blame. But I swear, if ever it lies in my power, I will be revenged on him. I will let you know, Mr. Thrasher, with a vengeance, that people's bones are not to be broken for nothing. Though I am but a servant, yet I am a man of honor. After having been in your service for four years, you shall not pay me with a switch, nor affront me in so sensible a part as my shoulders. I tell you once more, I shall find a way to be revenged. You are in love with a certain slave. You would fain induce me to get her for you, but I will manage matters so that somebody else shall carry her off. The deuce take me if I don't. Hear me, Mascarille, and moderate your passion. I always liked you, and often wished that a young fellow, faithful and clever like you, might one day or other take a fancy to enter my service. In a word, if you think my offer worthy of acceptance, and if you have a mind to serve me, from this moment I engage you. With all my heart, sir, and so much the rather because good fortune in serving you offers me an opportunity of being revenged, and because in my endeavours to please you I shall at the same time punish that wretch. In a word, by my dexterity, I hope to get Celia for... My love has provided already for that. Smitten by a faultless fair one, I have just now bought her for less than her value. What? Celia belongs to you, then? You should see her this minute, if I were the master of my own actions. But alas, it is my father who is so, since he is resolved, as I understand, by a letter brought me, to make me marry Hippolyta. I would not have this affair come to his knowledge, lest it should exasperate him. Therefore, in my arrangement with Truffaldin, from whom I just now parted, I acted purposely in the name of another. When the affair was settled, my ring was chosen as a token, on the sight of which Truffaldin is to deliver Celia. But I must first arrange the ways and means to conceal from the eyes of others the girl who so much charms my own, and then find some retired place where this lovely captive may be secreted. A little way out of town lives an old relative of mine, whose house I can take the freedom to offer you. There you may safely lodge her, and not a creature know anything of the matter. Indeed, so I can. You have delighted me with the very thing I wanted. Here, take this, and go and get possession of the fair one. 
as soon as ever Trufaldin sees my ring, my girl will be immediately delivered into your hands. You can then take it to that house when... Uh, but hist! Here comes Hippolyta. Scene 10. Hippolyta, Leander, Mascarille. I have some news for you, Leander, but will you be pleased or displeased with it? To judge of that, and make answer off hand, I should know it. Give me your hand, then, as far as the church, and I will tell it you as we go. Leander, to Mascarille. Go, make haste, and serve me in that business without delay. Scene 11. Mascarille alone. Yes. I will serve you up a dish of my own dressing. Was there ever in the world so lucky a fellow? How delighted Lelio will be soon. His mistress to fall into our hands by these means. To derive his whole happiness from the man he would have expected to ruin him. To become happy by the hands of a rival. After this great exploit, I desire that due preparations be made to paint me as hero crowned with laurel and that underneath the portrait be inscribed in letters of gold vivat mascarulis rogum imperator scene twelve trifaldin mascarille soho there what do you want this ring which you know will inform you what business brings me hither yes i recognize that ring perfectly stay a little I will fetch you the slave. Scene 13. Trafalden, a messenger, Mascarille. Messenger to Trafalden. Do me the favor, sir, to tell me where lives a gentleman. What gentleman? I think his name is Trafalden. And what is your business with him, pray? I am he. Only to deliver this letter to him. Trafalden reads. Providence, whose goodness watches over my life, has just brought to my ears a most welcome report, that my daughter, who was stolen from me by some robbers when she was four years old, is now a slave at your house under the name of Celia. If ever you knew what it was to be a father, and if natural affection makes an impression on your heart, then keep in your house this child so dear to me and treat her as if she were your own flesh and blood. I am preparing to set out myself in order to fetch her. You shall be so well rewarded for your trouble, that in everything that relates to your happiness, which I am determined to advance, you shall have reason to bless the day in which you caused mine. Don Pedro de Guzman, from Madrid, Marquess of Maltocana. Though the gypsies can be seldom believed, Yet they who sold her to me told me she would soon be fetched by somebody, and that I should have no reason to complain. Yet here I was going, all through my impatience, to lose the fruits of a great expectation. To the messenger. Had you come but one moment later, your journey would have been in vain. I was going this very instant to give the girl up into this gentleman's hands. But it is well. I shall take great care of her. Exit messenger. To Mascareel. You yourself have heard what this letter says, so you may tell the person who sent you that I cannot keep my word, and that he had better come and receive his money back. But the way you insult him. Go about your business, and no more words. Mascareel alone. Oh, what a curse that this letter came now. Fate is indeed against me. What bad luck for this messenger to come from Spain when he was not wanted. May thunder and hail go with him. Never, certainly, had so happy a beginning, such a sad ending, in so short a time. Scene 14. Lelio laughing. Mascarille. What may be the cause of all thy mirth? Oh, let me have my laugh out before I tell you. Let us laugh then heartily. We have abundant cause so to do. Oh, I shall no longer be the object of your expostulations. You who always reproach me shall no longer say that I am marrying all your schemes, like a busybody as I am. 
I myself have played you one of the cleverest tricks in the world. It is true I am quick-tempered, and now and then rather too hasty, but yet, when I have a mind to it, I can plan as many tricks as any man alive. Even you shall own that what I have done shows an amount of sharpness rarely to be met with. Let us hear what tricks you have invented. Just now, being terribly frightened upon seeing Trafalden along with my rival, I was casting about to find a remedy for that mischief, when, calling all my invention to my aid, I conceived, digested, and perfected a stratagem, before which all yours, however vain you may be of them, ought undoubtedly to lower their colours. But what may this be? May it please you to have a little patience. Without much delay, I invented a letter, written by an imaginary nobleman to Trifaldin, setting forth that, having fortunately heard, that a certain slave, who lives in the latter's house, and is named Celia, was this grandee's daughter, formerly kidnapped by thieves. It was his intention to come and fetch her, and he entreats him at least to keep her, and take great care of her, for that on her account he was setting out from Spain, and would acknowledge his civility by such handsome presents, that he should never regret being the means to making him happy. Mighty well. Hear me out. Here is something much cleverer still. The letter I speak of was delivered to him. But can you imagine how? Only just in time, for the messenger told me, had it not been for this droll device, a fellow, who looked very foolish, was waiting to carry her off that identical moment. And you did all this without the help of the devil? <sighs> yes. Would you have believed me capable of such a subtle piece of wit? At least praise my skill and the dexterity of which I have utterly disconcerted the scheme of my rival. To praise you as you deserve, I lack eloquence, and feel unequal to the task. Yes, sufficiently to commend this lofty effort, this fine stratagem of war achieved before our eyes, this grand and rare effect of a mind which plans as many tricks as any man, which for smartness yields to none alive. My tongue wants words. I wish I had the abilities of the most refined scholar, so that I might tell you in the noblest verse, or else in learned prose, that you will always be, in spite of everything that may be done, the very same you have been all your life. That is to say, a scatterbrain, a man of distempered reason, always perplexed, wanting common sense, a man of left-handed judgment a meddler, an ass, a blundering, hair-brained, giddy fellow. Oh, what can I think of? A hundred times worse than anything I can say. This is only an abridgment of your panegyric. Oh, tell me, what puts you in such a passion with me? Have I done anything? Clear up this matter. No, you have done nothing at all. But do not come after me. I will follow you all over the world to find out this mystery. Do so. Come on, then. Get your legs in order. I shall give you an opportunity to exercise them. Lelio, alone. He has got away from me. Oh, misfortune which cannot be allayed. What am I to understand by his discourse? And what harm can I possibly have done to myself? End of Act Two Act Three of The Blunderer, or The Counterplots, by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One, Masqueril, Alone. Silence, my good nature, and plead no more. You are a fool, and I am determined not to do it. Yes, my anger, you are right, I confess it. To be forever doing what a meddler undoes is showing too much patience, and I ought to give it up after the glorious attempts he has marred. But let us argue the matter a while without passion. If I should now give way to my just impatience, the world will say I sank under difficulties, that my cunning was completely exhausted. What then becomes of that public esteem which extols you everywhere as a first-rate rogue, 
and which you have acquired upon so many occasions because you never yet were found wanting in inventions honor masqueril is a fine thing do not pause in your noble labors and whatever a master may have done to incense you complete your work for your own glory and not to oblige him but what success can you expect if you are thus continually crossed by your evil genius you see he compels you every moment to change your tone you may as well hold the water in a sieve as to try to stop that resistless torrent which in a moment overturns the most beautiful structures raised by your art well once more out of kindness and whatever may happen let us take some pains even if they are in vain yet if he still persists in baffling my designs then i shall withdraw all assistance after all your affairs are not going on badly if we could but supplant our rival and if leander at last weary of his pursuit would leave us one whole day for my intended operations yes i have a most ingenious plot in my head from which i expect a glorious success if i had no longer that obstacle in my way well let us see if he still persists in his love scene two leander masqueril sir i have lost my labour true falden will not keep his word he himself has told me the whole affair but what is more i have discovered that all this pretty rigmarole about celia being carried off by gypsies and having a great nobleman for a father who is setting out from spain to come hither is nothing but a mere stratagem a merry trick a made-up story a tale raised by lelio to prevent my buying celia here is roguery for you and yet this ridiculous story has produced such an impression on truffardin and he has swallowed the bait of this shallow device so greedily that he will not allow himself to be undeceived so that henceforth he will watch her carefully i do not see we can do anything more if at first i thought this girl amiable i now find her absolutely adorable and i am in doubt whether i ought not to employ extreme measures to make her my own thwart her ill fortune by plighting her my troth and turn her present chains into matrimonial ones would you marry her i am not yet determined but if her origin is somewhat obscure her charms and her virtue are gentle attractions which have incredible force to allure every heart did you not mention her virtue ha huh? what is that you mutter out with it explain what you mean by repeating the word virtue sir your countenance changes all of a sudden perhaps i had much better hold my tongue no no speak out well then out of charity i will cure you of your blindness that girl proceed so far from being merciless makes no difficulty in obliging some people in private you may believe me after all she is not a stony hearted to any one who knows how to take her in the right mood she looks demure but would fain pass for a prude but i can speak of her on sure grounds you know i understand something of the craft and ought to know that kind of cattle what celia yes her modesty is nothing but a mere sham the semblance of a virtue which will never hold out but vanishes as one may discover before the shining rays emitted from a purse heavens what do you tell me can i believe such words sir there is no compulsion what does it matter to me no pray do not believe me follow your own inclination take the sly girl and marry her the whole city in a body will acknowledge this favour you marry the public good in her what a strange surprise he has taken the bait courage my lad if he does but swallow it in good earnest we shall have got rid of a very awkward obstruction on your path this astonishing account nearly kills me what can you go to the post-office and see if there is a letter for me 
alone, and for a while lost in thought. Who would not have been imposed upon? If what he says be true, then there never was any countenance more deceiving. Scene three. Lelio, Leander. What may be the cause of your looking so sad? Who? I? Yes, yourself. I have, however, no occasion to be so. I see well enough what it is. Celia is the cause of it. My mind does not run upon such trifles. And yet, you had formed some grand scheme to get her into your hands. But you must speak thus, as your stratagem has miscarried. Were I fool enough to be enamoured of her, I should laugh at all your finesse. What finesse, pray? Good heavens! Sir, we know all. All what? All your actions, from beginning to end. Oh, this is all Greek to me. I do not understand one word of it. Pretend, if you please, not to understand me. But believe me, do not apprehend that I shall take a property which I should be sorry to dispute with you. I adore a beauty who has not been sullied, and do not wish to love a depraved woman. Gently, gently, Leander. Oh, how credulous you are! I tell you once more, you may attend on her now without suspecting anybody. You may call yourself a lady-killer. It is true, her beauty is very uncommon, but, to make amends for that, the rest is common enough. Leander, no more of this provoking language. Strive against me as much as you like in order to obtain her. But, above all things, do not traduce her so vilely. I should consider myself a great coward if I could tamely submit to hear my earthly deity slandered. I can much better bear your rivalry than listen to any speech that touches her character. What I state here I have from very good authority. Whoever told you so is a scoundrel and a rascal. Nobody can discover the least blemish in this young lady. I know her heart well. But yet Mascarille is a very competent judge in such a cause. He thinks her guilty. He? He himself. Does he pretend impudently to slander a most respectable young lady, thinking, perhaps, I should only laugh at it? I will lay you a wager he eats his words. I will lay you a wager he does not. It's death. I would break every bone in his body should he dare to assert such lies to me. And I will crop his ears if he does not prove every syllable he has told me. Scene four. Lelio, Leander, Mascareel. Oh, that's lucky. There he is. Come hither, cursed hangdog. What is the matter? Your serpent's tongue. So full of lies. Dare you fasten your stings on Celia and slander the most consummate virtue that ever added luster to misfortune. Gently. I told him so on purpose. No, no. None of your winking, and none of your jokes. I am blind and deaf to all you do or say. If it were my own brother, he should pay dear for it. For to dare defame her whom I adore is to wound me in the most tender part. You make all these signs in vain. What was it you said to him? Good heavens, do not quarrel, or I shall leave you. You shall not stir a step. Oh. Speak, then. Confess. Let me alone. I tell you, it is a stratagem. Make haste. What was it you said? Clear up this dispute between us. I said what I said. Pray, do not put yourself in a passion. Lelio, drawing his sword. I shall make you talk in another strain. Leander, stopping him. Stay your hand a little. Moderate your ardour. Mascarille, aside. Was there ever in the world a creature so dull of understanding? Allow me to wreak my just vengeance on him. It is rather too much to wish to chastise him in my presence. What? Have I no right, then, to chastise my own servant? What do you mean by saying, your servant? Mascarille, aside. He is at it again. He will discover all. Suppose I had a mind to thrash him within an inch of his life. What then? He is my own servant. At present, he is mine. <laughs> that is an admirable little joke. How comes he to be yours? Surely. Gently. 
What are you whispering? Mascarille aside. Oh, the confounded blockhead. He is going to spoil everything. He understands not one of my signs. You are dreaming, Leander. You are telling me a pretty story. Is he not my servant? Did you not discharge him from your service for some fault? I do not know what this means. And did you not, in the violence of your passion, make his back smart most unmercifully? No such thing. I discharge him. Cudgel him. Either you make a jest of me, Leander, or he has been making a jest of you. Masqueril aside. Go on, go on, numbskull. You will do your own business effectually. Leander to Masqueril. Then all this cudgelling is purely imaginary? He does not know what he says. His memory... No, no. All these signs do not look well for you. I suspect some prettily contrived trick here. But for the ingenuity of the invention, go your ways. I forgive you. It is quite enough that I am undeceived, and see now why you imposed upon me. I come off cheap because I trusted myself to your hypocritical zeal. A word to the wise is enough. Farewell, Lelio. Farewell. Your most obedient servant. Scene five. Lelio, Mascarille. Take courage, my boy. May fortune ever attend us. Let us draw and bravely take the field. Let us act. Olibrius, the slayer of the innocents. He accused you of slandering. And you could not let the artifice pass, nor let him remain in his error, which did you good service, and which pretty nearly extinguished his passion. No, honest soul, he cannot bear dissimulation. I cunningly get a footing at his rivals, who, like a dolt, was going to place his mistress in my hands. But he, Lelio, prevents me getting hold of her by a fictitious letter. I try to abate the passion of his rival. My hero presently comes and undeceives him. In vain I make signs to him and show him it was all a contrivance of mine. It signifies nothing. He continues to the end and never rests satisfied till he has discovered all. Grand and sublime effect of a mind which is not inferior to any man living. It is an exquisite piece and worthy in troth to be made a present of to the king's private museum. I am not surprised that I do not come up to your expectations. If I am not acquainted with the designs you are setting on foot, I shall be for ever making mistakes. So much the worse. At least, if you would be justly angry with me, give me a little insight into your plan. But if I am kept ignorant of every contrivance, I must always be caught napping. I believe you would make a very good fencing master, because you are so skilful at making feints, and at parrying of a thrust. Since the thing is done, let us think no more about it. My rival, however, will not have it in his power to cross me, and provided you will but exert your skill, in which I trust... Let us drop this discourse and talk of something else. I am not so easily pacified. Not I. I am in too great a passion for that. In the first place, you must do to me a service, and then we shall see whether I ought to undertake the management of your amours. If it only depends on that, I will do it. Tell me, have you need of my blood, of my sword? How cracked-brained he is! You are just like those swashbucklers who are always more ready to draw their sword than to produce a tester if it were necessary to give it. What can I do, then, for you? You must, without delay, endeavour to appease your father's anger. We have become reconciled already. Yes, but I am not. I killed him this morning for your sake. The very idea of it shocks him. Those sorts of jokes are severely felt by such old fellows as he, which, much against their will, make them reflect sadly on the near approach of death. The good sire, notwithstanding his age, is very fond of life, and cannot bear jesting upon that subject. He is alarmed at the prognostication, and so very angry 
that i hear he has lodged a complaint against me i am afraid that if i am once housed at the expense of the king i may like it so well after the first quarter of an hour that i shall find it very difficult afterwards to get away there have been several warrants out against me this good while for virtue is always envied and persecuted in this abominable age therefore go and make my peace with your father yes i shall soften his anger but you must promise me then we shall see what there is to be done exit lelio now let us take a little breath after so many fatigues let us stop for a while the current of our intrigues and not move about hither and thither as if we were hobgoblins leander cannot hurt us now and celia cannot be removed through the contrivance of scene six ergast masqueril i was looking for you everywhere to render you a service i have a secret of importance to disclose what may that be can no one overhear us not a soul we are as intimate as two people can be i am acquainted with all your projects and the love of your master mind what you are about by and by leander has formed a plot to carry off celia i have been told he has arranged everything and designs to get into truffledine's house in disguise having heard that at this time of the year some ladies of the neighbourhood often visit him in the evening in masks ay well he has not yet reached the height of his happiness i may perhaps be beforehand with him and as to this thrust i know how to give him a counter thrust by which he may run himself through he is not aware with what gifts i am endowed farewell we shall take a cup together next time we meet scene seven masqueril alone we must we must reap all possible benefit from this amorous scheme and by a dexterous and uncommon counterplot endeavour to make the success our own without any danger if i put on a mask and be beforehand with leander he will certainly not laugh at us if we take the prize ere he comes up he will have paid for us the expenses of the expedition for as his project has already become known suspicion will fall upon him and we being safe from all pursuit need not fear the consequences of that dangerous enterprise thus we shall not show ourselves but use a cat's paw to take the chestnuts out of the fire now then let us go and disguise ourselves with some good fellows we must not delay if we wish to be beforehand with our gentry i love to strike when the iron is hot and can without much difficulty provide in one moment men and dresses depend on it i do not let my skill lie dormant if heaven has endowed me with the gift of knavery i am not one of those degenerate minds who hide the talents they have received Scene eight, Lelio, our guest. He intends to carry her off during a masquerade. There is nothing more certain. One of his band informed me of his design, upon which I instantly ran to Masqueril and told him the whole affair. He said he would spoil their sport by some counter scheme which he planned in an instant. So, meeting with you by chance, i thought i ought to let you know the whole i am very much obliged to you for this piece of news go i shall not forget this faithful service exit air guest scene nine lelio alone my rascal will certainly play them some trick or other but i too have a mind to assist him in this project it shall never be said that in a business which so nearly concerns me I stirred no more than a post. This is the time. They will be surprised at the sight of me. Oh, why did I not take my blunderbuss with me? 
but let anybody attack me who likes. I have two good pistols and a trusty sword. So ho! Within there, a word with you. Scene 10. Trafalden at his window. Lelio. What is the matter? Who comes to pay me a visit? Keep your door carefully shut tonight. Why? There are certain people coming masked, to give you a sorry kind of serenade. They intend to carry off Celia. Good heavens! No doubt they will soon be here. Keep where you are. You may see everything from your window. Hey, did I not tell you so? Do you not see them already? Hist! I will affront them before your face. We shall see some fine fun if they do not give way. Scene 11. Lelio, Trafalden, Mascarille, and his company masked. Oh, the funny blades who think to surprise me. Maskers, whither so fast? Will you let me into the secret? Trafalden, pray open the door to these gentry, that they may challenge us for a throw with a dice. To Mascarille, disguised as a woman. Oh, good heavens! What a pretty creature! Oh, what a darling she looks! How now? What are you mumbling? Without offence, may I remove your mask and see your face? Hence, ye wicked rogues! Be gone, ye ragamuffins! And you, sir, good night, and many thanks. Scene 12. Lelio, Mascareel. Lelio, after having taken the mask from Mascareel's face. Mascarelle, is that you? No, not at all. It is somebody else. Alas! How astonished I am! How adverse is our fate! Oh, could I possibly have guessed this, as you did not secretly inform me that you were going to disguise yourself? Oh, wretch that I am, thoughtlessly to play you such a trick, while you wore this mask! I am in an awful passion for myself, and have a good mind to give myself a sound beating. Farewell, most refined wit, unparalleled inventive genius. Alas! If your anger deprives me of your assistance, what saint shall I invoke? Beelzebub. Ah, if your heart is not made of stone or iron, do once more at least forgive my imprudence. If it is necessary to be pardoned that I should kneel before you, behold. Fiddlesticks. Come, my boys, let us away. I hear some other people coming closely behind us. Scene 13. Leander and his company masked. Trafalden at the window. Softly. Let us do nothing but in the gentlest manner. Trafalden at the window. How is this? What? Mummers besieging my door all night? Gentlemen, do not catch a cold gratuitously. Everyone who is catching it here must have plenty of time to lose. It is rather a little too late to take Celia along with you. She begs you will excuse her tonight. The girl is in bed and cannot speak to you. I am very sorry, but to repay you for all the trouble you have taken for her sake, she begs you will be pleased to accept this pot of perfume. Oh, that does not smell nicely. My clothes are all spoiled. We are discovered. Let us be gone this way. End of Act Three